I don't think of myself as an artist. I think of myself as a, a filmmaker or a, a maker of things. I make stuff because it pleases me. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rupert Bottenberg. I'm the Director of Animation Programming at the Fantasia International Film Festival, which is celebrating its 25th year, its 25th anniversary this year, excuse me. Uh, the video of you just watched, the tribute reel, uh, was put together by Eric Lavoie from the Fantasia team, and it features footage from Alexandre Poncet's documentary, Phil Tippett, Mad Dreams and Monsters. And it's the perfect way to begin this evening's um, special live event, uh, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award presentation and masterclass with visual effects master Phil Tippett. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Tippett. I can't see my picture. Oh, hold on. Let me get it. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh. There he is. Oh, there I am. Okay. Hello. Hello, Phil. Hey. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. And thank you so much for having created and shared with us Mad God, which we are tremendously proud to have presented at Fantasia this year. My pleasure. And uh, it's also a great honor to be presenting you uh, in honor of the uh, so many essential icons and elements that you've crafted over the years that have become essential parts of the uh, collective popular imagination in modern times, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And I believe you have uh, your award with you there. There it I, is, everybody. Yeah, my, my kids call them my trophies. Come on, you. Okay. It's a, it's a trophy. I like, the, I like that. <laughs> it's uh, beautiful to see. Yeah, look at it. There it is, glamour shot. The finest plastic materials money can buy. <laughs> well, we're very, very pleased to be able to give this to you. It's uh, you've been uh, such an essential part of the lives of pretty much everyone. I think I speak for the entire Fantasia team that uh, the work you've done has always been uh, of great value to us. And now you've brought us, of course, 
the wonderful Mad God, um, which is, uh, I, I think it's safe to say, your most personal work and your, your, your masterwork, really. I don't know how many people would consider it wonderful. I certainly do. Oh, good. But I've got, I've got a, a perhaps a strange sense of humor, and that's something I might want to get into you at some point. I get into with you at some point is uh, humor. Sure. But uh, the first thing I'd really like to know, uh, Phil, is how how you feel now that after these many many years of work on this uh, on this film, it's finally done. It's out there in the world. How are you feeling about the film? I want it to be in my past. You know, it, it had consumed me to the point of a psychiatric ward. <laughs> it was just like I, I've had enough of it. You know, I was just like, I, all I, I could do is just get behind the mule every morning. And did you ever see, um, what was it? Um, ah, never mind. <laughs> um but um what were we talking about about the uh the endurance test of uh of creating oh, yeah, mad god yeah so i've got a cottage out back where for you know the better part of 30 years 20 years i collected tons of shit and um i was uh, i um i admired the artist um no, the, oh boy, my, my brain, I'm still recovering from jet lag. Um, he made, anyway, I'll remember at some point in time. But um, you don't have to worry about that here in Montreal right now. The humidity is so thick, you can cut it with a knife. Uh, so I think everybody here is very comfortable with uh, a, uh, a slow pace of things. Yeah, well, this guy. Um, would go from uh, antique stores to to um, swap meets and whatever, and would pull out different things and um, pay a quarter for them and take them back to a studio. And he would work on three or four things simultaneously, like I generally do. And you know, you get to a point where you get stuck and you don't know what to do, so you move on to something else and let it ruminate for a bit. And um, um, so I emulated him, you know, I just collected tons and tons and tons of shit. And, um, so now that Mad God's over with, I just wanted to put it behind me. Like I do everything, you know, I, I don't, I just put the past behind me and move on. And now it's time to do that. So I'm, I'm, um, reconfiguring the cottage to be a painting studio for my wife and all the work that I did in there over the last 20 years is done and over with and I won't ever go into that space again I should get a priest to come in and you know, <laughs> de, you know do an exorcism on it mm. well the final results uh, are uh, certainly something that I think plenty of people are going to treasure so there is something to be said for that. Um, I'm curious, though, the uh, to what extent? I mean, this project you've been, you know, working on for so long. To what ex to what extent were, was your initial vision for it, the way you imagined the film would be when you began? How much of that is actually retained or made it through to what we now finally see? Well, I wrote about fifteen. Um pages of the barest outline that was you know pretty much tone that's about it and that indicated like a few levels and what it was extremely general you know it was just like it could go any which way and um so uh i started shooting it right after robocop 2 in the late 80s and then the project was too big in scope and I lost my crew. So I put it on ice and um, there it sat for, for 20 years. And um, I, my wife um, was in the editorial department on Amadeus. And so 
you know, I got to know Mila Shorman pretty well. We go out to dinner and uh, I, as a young filmmaker, would ask him for advice. And uh, what he said was the best advice about filmmaking I ever got, which was to, if you want to take a good shit, you have to eat well. And that resonated with me, you know, which kind of validated where I needed to go on my compass uh, for the next 20 years that I just had to absorb so much stuff that I wanted to and gain knowledge about things that I didn't know, like Dante and Milton, very much inspired by Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Bruegel and his son and um yeah so you know i i just headed down that path and just um you know we did a uh uh so uh, yeah i i uh was just accumulating as much stuff as i possibly could for my brain like archaeology and art history and literature music and everything I could think of. And that's what I did. I ate well for the better part of 20 years, you know, just internalizing, you know, all of this stuff. And that's really where all the work was done, you know, was in that, that period. And uh, so I emerged, emerged from that um, with a pretty strong foundation that really was not, It was kind of like it was like part of a buried civilization that I had to excavate and dig down into and um, and explore, just like the main character, the the assassin, is just going down, down, down. In mm. And are you familiar with? Um, let's see. Hmm thinking of eh, never mind i'm still recovering from jet lag <laughs> understood understood by the way we got a comment here from a uh, jean oquine saying the artist you were mentioning before who collected stuff and put together he said is cornell the artist yes joseph <laughs> cornell yes all right very good john oquine you went a, uh, a round Potter's of applause dad. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to uh, what we were talking about at the beginning, um, the, uh, the, 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 the element of humor. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, this could just be a reflection on me and, you know, my own mental health. But, you know, I found that it was a tremendous amount of humor and a tremendous amount to laugh at in Mad God. Uh, perhaps not like a, a, a you know a lighthearted, cheerful laughter, more of you know no. a laughter. But you know, it got me to thinking that you know when um, when we do these deep dives into darkness and into the nightmarish and to that which disturbs us, I feel almost like the same way that a deep sea diver needs to wear an oxygen tank and have that oxygen supply to breathe. When when going into darkness, having a supply of humor can be absolutely vital. That's that's my feeling. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm a funny guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it just becomes natural. I mean, it's just natural. I don't think about it at all. Uh, but, you know, if I did, it was, um, you know, uh, what were you talking about? Humor, the humor in your work. Oh, yeah, it just, you know, um, more analytically, you know, it's, um, you know, typically used in horror as like a contrast or a antidote, you know, to the mayhem. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's the way, you know, I was really not that intentional about how he did anything but that's just kind of the way it came out and i'm sure it was fed by that those 20 years of eating well a lot of stuff i didn't have to think about it was just like just totally intuitive mm. 
the uh, the creatures you've created uh, for specifically for Mad God. I mean, these are creatures that you've had to live with and dance with, work with for so long. Are there any that you've built a particular attachment to that you are particularly fond of? No, not one. I never have been attached to anything. You know, it's just like make it move on. It fulfills the function of what is needed then it works and that's it and then it goes on a shelf hmm. um it, included with the uh, the bundle for your film uh, at fantasia this year <clears throat> we've also shown the documentary that your daughter made about you mm -hmm. your daughter maya what mm -hmm. was that experience like that's uh, to shift to well, shift kind of to somebody else's film but mm -hmm. it's uh, you know it's about you and it's about the making of mad god but that's you know a different relationship than I would imagine with a, a regular documentary filmmaker. Yeah, Maya knew more about me than just about anybody, so she was kind of an ideal candidate to go in there and get a little bit more personal than a lot of people do. So um, yeah, that was her uh, graduate thesis at Pratt. So yeah, she chose well. <laughs> Mm. Well, it was certainly an enjoyable film. I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to tell the uh, the audience at home um, that uh, the uh, the the film is available uh, for you to watch right until the end of the festival. And I strongly encourage you to watch it. It's really quite something. Quite on enjoyable. a big screen with a bottle of wine. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Phil, something else I'd like to talk with you about, uh, this is detouring away. Um, you've actually worked with um, all kinds of people uh, throughout uh, your career in, uh, in Hollywood, in filmmaking. But I understand that you have a very close relationship with Paul Verhoeven. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about your friendship with him? Uh, what's, well, he, what's he like? What kind of guy is he? You know, Paul and I are, um, have a very similar world views and political views and mm -hmm. um we're both very misanthropic about mankind but still have a great deal of hope because you have to <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh so paul you know uh we uh met on robocop and mm -hmm. um went on to do starship troopers and um yeah, we were, we could do the Vulcan mind meld thing, you know, mm. and uh, almost communicate telepathically. And um, so he was a tremendous mentor for me. I learned a great deal from Paul, you know, about filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Do you still see him now and then? We communicate from time to time. Um, he, I sent him uh, the first three chapters of Mad God, and uh, he contacted me and said, when I make my Jesus movie, uh, I want you to do the scene where Jesus goes to hell, or meets Satan. Mm -hmm. so. Is that, uh, is he... Uh... Is that in the works? Because uh, he wrote a book, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, uh, it's a really great book. Highly recommend it. Well, I uh, I actually got my hands on it, was hoping to uh, read it so that we could, you know, enthrall the viewers at home with uh, hours and hours of discussion of Nicene Council, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was not, unfortunately, able this uh, this summer to to read the book yet, but I've got it sitting here. What can you tell me about it? What can I what can I expect going into that? Oh, book? you know, I, um like uh, the filmmaker Pierre Paolo Pasolini, uh, Paul is a Jesus scholar, and he comes up to uh, Marin for the Jesus Seminar just about every year, and they look into who the authentic Jesus was, and that's the you know a focus of their study about who the real guy was, and you know they discount all the myths and uh but like Pasolini um you know Paul is, and the other scholars are convinced that uh Jesus not Christ 
Jesus, mm. the man, um, was a heretic. You know, he was like Che Guevara. He was a terrorist. And um, it just totally upsets the apple cart on, you know, yeah, how would be thy name and all that, you know. And so there, there's amazing stories in it that I won't bore you with, but I can, you know, it, it, it's what's interesting about it is like it's from the point of view of a filmmaker who's like studying and making notes for a movie that he wants to make that he never will, you know, because we told him, Paul, if you make that movie, you know, you're going to get assassinated. <laughs> Uh, well, now I'm really intrigued. I have to dig into it. Um, yeah. Can I use uh, this opportunity uh, to do a little bit of Montreal love here and recommend a book to you? Uh, because I really feel like you've recommended this to me uh, on a similar on the same topic, in fact, by a Montreal writer named Nino Ricci. He wrote a book called Testament, which is uh, the last few days of the life of Yehoshua the Nazarene, as you said, the man, Jesus. Uh, from four points of view, uh, that of Judas, that of uh, Mary Magdalene, that of uh, Mary, Mother of Christ, and uh, also that of, um, I believe, Simon. Um, it's been some years since I read it, but it's it is. Fiction. It's fiction, right? <clears throat> it's fiction. It's how he imagines from a secular perspective. Yeah, I'm not interested in that. Mm. I don't care about what people think. <laughs> well, for viewers at home, it's a wonderful book, but no, uh, I uh, certainly intrigued by um, by Verhoeven's book. Um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, sort of do a slightly deeper dive back into the past. You're uh, you 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 didn't follow the usual path of um, of uh, of film school. You actually studied fine arts. Uh, I had no choice. You know, the Vietnam War was going on, so I had to you know, get a student deferment and go to school. But that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I landed at UC Irvine right at the time that conceptual art was exploding. And that was, that changed my life significantly. And, you know, no longer were you tied to, you know, painting and sculpture and drawing and lithography. It was just ideas, you know, what are your ideas? And, that was a, you know, um, my instructors were, um, you know, uh, Bastian Otter and uh, uh, Michael Asher, who, you know, are in, remembered as all the, you know, the great, you know, in the great, in the beginnings of conceptual art. And so they were my mentors and became my friends. And I would help them out with their studios and, um, uh, uh, galleries. I was really good at, at sheetrock and um, mud and painting. So you know, I, I, they would hire me to you know do all kinds of stuff. Hmm. What kind of pro what kind of projects of your own did you do? I'm kind of curious. Well, depends on how much time you have. I'll I'll have to put my trophy down. Um. One of them was a, um, it was a construction. It was like, I, I, I constructed these wooden uh, stanchions that would support a um, pull-up bar. So what you saw was, mm, let's see if I can <laughs> pull that from right. It was like a bar that goes across, you know, the top third of the screen, shot in black and white on video. Video cameras had just kind of come out. Mm -hmm. And um, so this has got to be in the early 70s at UC Irvine. And so I, I put the camera on a tripod, trained it high, and put uh, notices up all over campus uh, that there was going to be a competition, a pull-up bar competition, and the winners would get a six pack of beer. And so I got 20 or 30 people that showed up in this gallery and um, the thing is silent. And so what you see is like hands going up and, and grabbing this bar, but then 
all you, you know, I can't do it accurately, but you just <laughs> see this below, you know, that's informing that there's, you know, what you think it is. But that's how you know, is by what's not there. And um, uh, so that is imagined. It's just in your consciousness, you know, through observation. And so, you know, that would go on and, you know, the, you know, fat kids would go like, Bing, like that. And then of course the, the athletes won and uh, got the beer. So that was one. And then the other one was, I'm not quite sure. I had a very strong intuitive feeling about this, but had no idea where it was gonna go. And so what I did was I had, I got a bunch of friends to uh, um, uh, speak into a reel to reel, about a 20 minute reel to reel tape recorder. And cause that's all we had. And they would say the vowels, A, 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 over and over and over again. Um, and then, you know, I would record them doing um, E, 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 and go through all the hard vowels and then have, you know, other people, um, uh, you know, do the soft vowels. And, you know, and I used their, their breath as the meter. Uh, 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 uh. So if I thought today to do it, you know, with the technology available, it would not have the same analog feeling. You know, you mm. just put it, put it on a loop and it's not the same as human breath determining the cadence of the thing. So that's the clock that you get is human breath. And, um, and the arbitrary 20 minutes on the reel to reel thing um, was what it was. And so, in the gallery, the galleries at UC Irvine were really that was square and high and huge. There was a tremendous amount of echo. And um, uh, so I placed these uh, recordings on uh, sculpture pedestals about four feet high and put all of the um, recorders on uh, on them spaced out like the pentagram you know about mm -hmm. four feet from the edges of the wall and turn them on and what happened was and i i heard it the first time everybody else did mm. it was um these voices depending upon where you your proximity to a recorder would hear a a a, and as you moved around the room, you would hear the other vowels. If you went to the center, because the room was very echoey, they would all combine. And that was the weird part, because they kind of combined into what seemed like a proto-language, something that you could barely understand, you know, but yet sort of made sense. It was kind of inspired by the work of Barry Lavaugh. Although I didn't know it at the time, like a lot of times you don't know what you're doing until you've finished it. And sometimes you need weeks or months or years to figure out what the hell it was you were doing. So mm. there. That's uh, bring something up. Uh, they sort of triggered an interesting thought for me is the, uh, the way the mind sort of fills in spaces, even the ones that don't necessary, necessarily necessarily need to be filled our, our mind is you know the pattern recognition and so forth it's uh you know like audio hallucinations when you're hearing like uh, jackhammers i've been getting this we've got construction in the neighborhood and so you've got the uh that loud roar of the uh of the machines and i find like my mind has a habit of trying to like put music in there to create create some kind of sense out of it hmm. and uh anyway i find that's uh a very interesting dimension to what you just brought up that that particular installation yeah i'd like to reconstruct there's there's some interest i have some friends that um a, a friend the new york conceptual artist lucy raven and i have made some 
um, short films together. And uh, so uh, we showed Mad God as a work in progress like two years ago. So it was really bare bones at MoMA. But they expressed some interest in uh, perhaps, you know, once it was complete to do a, a, a show of artifacts and whatnot. Hmm, do you think that, uh, does that still look like it's going to happen? Because that's, uh, that's something I would love to see. It's just, that's something I love about stop motion animation is the tactile, that these are actual real things and that, uh, you know, that they could be seen, they could be walked around and so forth. That's, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, part of, and par probably part of the enjoyment of making, uh, making stop motion films is that it's, uh, that they're, they're really there, that you're, you're actually, you know, even though it's reduced for scale, um, it's an actual existing environment. Yeah, yeah, they're, you know, I, I prefer them to actors, you know, because they'll wait for you and all you have to do is dust them off if you haven't used them for a while. <laughs> uh, Phil, now that you've uh, completed Mad God, which is, you know, such an epic piece of work that took so much of your life, um, what's, what's next? What are you, what's your next... You know, or do you even know what your next creative project is going to be? Well, over COVID for the last year and a half, I have been busy coming up with a sequel to Mad God. Mm. But it's nothing like Mad God. I mean, as they say, the canary sings one song. So there's like whatever my stamp is going to be on it. But it's much more lighthearted. It's character driven. Um, you know, it's an odyssey. It's called Pequin's Pendigrin, <laughs> um, which was uh, something I held on to and wrote down. Uh, a, a friend of mine and I in college were smoking a lot of marijuana, and somehow this came up, this, this term for something. I forget what it was for. Uh, and it just stuck with me. And so everything revolves around the main character Pequin, but I've got, I've got a pretty extensive treatment. I've got all the storyboards. I've got, I made all the maquettes. There's about 30 of them. I shot them against blue screen. I did key art for, there's like 50 pieces of key art. And so uh, depending upon the success of Mad God, and if anybody wants to put any money into it, yeah, you know, this project and it's all all ready to go. Well, I sincerely hope that happens and I sincerely hope that we'll have a chance to show it at Fantasia yeah, sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah, this will not be like Mad God. I mean, I'm not doing it unless I can get the money and hire a crew to do it in a couple of years or so. Mm. Well, I sure hope we get to see it. Phil, thanks so much for taking the time this evening to talk with us and to share your, your history and your views on things. Um, what can I say other than, you know, you're really valuable to all of us here at Fantasia and it was great to have a chance to talk with you. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.